welcome to the first and beta episode of Football America. And uh, this is Greg James of from the 55 Yard Line podcast and also Gridiron Japan podcast. And uh, I'm sitting here today, I am in Japan, and I'm sitting here today with Aaron Harris of the Football Odyssey podcast. How you doing, brother? I'm doing good, man. Congratulations on the new show. And thank you for choosing me as your inaugural guest. I, you know, you were my first choice. That's, you know, I mean, when it comes to talking about, you know, it's one thing to talk about the games themselves and the X's and O's, but there's so much more to football and really more than more, much more to football and more to sports than just what happens on the field. And that's what I kind of wanted this show to be about to talk about kind of the outside forces that affect the games that we watch, that we love, whether it be basketball, baseball, obviously football, soccer, and even hockey. So, um, but when it comes to, you know, this, this show, it's about football, um, but we'll incorporate other elements of other sports in there as, as we go along in the conversation, obviously. And um, yeah, so we are, uh, this is the first episode. And we're going to sit down. The Super Bowl just ended yesterday. And what, you know, I mean, it was it was a great game. But there was so much to it beforehand. So, I mean, I'm, I'm sitting there as I'm watching the, the pregame hype. And then the inner 14-year-old, inner 12-year-old in me goes, man, it was so much different back in the 70s. So, um, yeah. So yeah, let's talk about the Super Bowl. Let's talk about yesterday. What 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 are your thoughts? What uh, obviously it was a good game, but did you watch all the Super Game uh, Super Bowl hype before all that? I did not watch a single minute, and I'm actually proud to say it at this point because it's become <laughs> a little uh, it's just overkill. And frankly, I was actually down in South Florida and I was driving back up, so I was getting the car for about two and a half to three hours commuting, so I wouldn't have had a chance to watch it anyway but uh by the time i got back to my apartment now i didn't feel the need to watch any pregame i turned it on at 6 30 and then 10 minutes later they kicked off um i used to really enjoy the the pregame aspect of it but now it just seems that there's far too much coverage leading up to it and there's only so many topics that you can dive into so many feature stories you can tell and frankly even throughout the week i didn't really listen to too many podcasts or radio shows previewing the game because after you know the first week what more can you really say you yeah just basically, and, you just basically get a lot of people that are getting on there to you know promote their sponsors oh yeah yeah i um being over here in japan i'm kind of insulated from at least the live stuff i don't have mm. i don't have cable anymore i don't have i mean i don't have satellite you know i can pick and choose what i want so mm. when it comes to how much i get over here i can be very selective so for me you know my day usually starts off um turning on um dan patrick Mm -hmm. the podcast and then rich eisen and then i'm done and so i only really my uh you know it's basically i have a little bit of an echo chamber i guess but but yeah it goes to what you said i mean it you know everybody at least on those shows was just everybody every player um what's his name from um um quarterback for jacksonville Trevor Lawrence. Trevor Lawrence. He was on there promoting a product. And so everybody was promoting something. Um, but what I was missing was what I was hoping for was, you know, say somebody from NFL films, somebody mm-hmm. to talk more about the history. Um, you know, Greg Cosell would have been a perfect guest for mm-hmm. the week at the Super Bowl. And he's been on before, but to talk not only about NFL films, but also his uncle, too. I always, anytime Greg Cosell goes on, a show i'm like oh there's going to be howard cosell talk at some point yeah. um so yeah no i'm right there with you i watched about two hours of it because in japan super bowl came on at 8 30 in the morning monday so i made sure i got up at 6 30 in the morning turned on uh that was about the time with the nfl international game pass mm-hmm. that's when the coverage starts so i watched that and believe me you missed absolutely nothing there wasn't even a retrospective of about you know there was a pat tillman thing that they always cram in right when there's a super bowl down in arizona and also to the veteran in me i still get very pissed off when the with the nfl and their salute to service crap because 
I, I know it's, you know, I, I, I think a lot of people there are genuine with, with their feelings and want to honor, but it's become so commercial that it, it's lost on me. At least I, I miss the USAA commercials with Gronk. I didn't see any of those this year. Yeah, the commercials this year, in my opinion, were uh, really not anything noteworthy. The only one that I really enjoyed was the Bush Light commercial where they were mimicking those um, abused animal shelters commercials. And you had like the werewolf, the bear. I don't know if you yeah. had a to that yeah. one. That, I, that, that to me was a humorous one. But aside from that, there was nothing that I noticed that was really stuck out to me. Uh, what stuck out to me was I didn't I didn't I didn't pay attention. I guess maybe did I? Yeah, I mean, it just like you said, it was so unmemorable. I'm like, okay, I don't really remember. The ones that really got me that I watched and I walked away going, really, what the hell is going on? Are they were the Caddyshack ones? Mm -hmm. They tried to parrot, they tried to, it was a parody of Caddyshack, and that just fell absolutely flat. It it did feel like a lot of these commercials were like targeting, uh, you know, people who were teenagers 20 or 30 years ago. You know, it's like you had a new Indiana Jones movie coming out that they were promoting, Right. Um, you know, Fast and Furious 10 (laughs) or whatever they're on. That was, that was a big draw. They had another one with, um. I don't remember the context of the commercial, but it was uh, P. Diddy producing in the studio and a bunch oh, of that, 90s that artists sucked. coming on and you know doing a parody of the song that they became famous for. It was like it, yeah. it felt like nostalgia was a big theme of this uh, this slate of commercials, but it just didn't really land anywhere for me personally. Yeah, it sucked. It. I mean, those. Yeah, those really fell flat. And mm-hmm. then there was one too. It was about well, the one you know going talking about um, movie trailers. Mm -hmm. um you saw the one for the flash i'm like oh okay i'm going to see that when that comes out because you know i don't know how big of a comic book fan you are or comic book movies but i'm a huge dc guy and obviously they're about ready to reset that whole universe anyway and i'm like oh maybe this might be the the way to reset everything and get that whole franchise on track because it looked like a really good trailer and uh, did, did, did you see it I don't want to spoil after it I'm probably not going to see the movie, but uh, yeah, this shows you how little I know about comic books. I used to enjoy the movies at one point, but I, I think after about like 2014 or 15, I just stopped watching them. Um, I looked to my buddy to my right who enjoys those movies more or less. Yeah. And I asked him, you know, like what is being fast? Uh, what is, what is being super fast as a superpower really going to do for you as a superhero? I mean, I, I, he told me that he can run, you know, so fast that he rips through the time portal. He can time travel. I'm like, you know, that's all well and good. But really, what what's his major power? You know, it's like Superman has super strength, you know, the Green Lantern you know, manifest energy. I didn't really see what the, the Flash's superpower was aside from being really fast. But he explained to me that he can move so fast that he can create a tornado if he runs in a circle or if he runs at you really fast. You know, he's like a ton of bricks. So. I guess that made sense to me after that, but I was kind of like, you know, it feels like a superpower you'd want to have if you want to run away from conflict. Right, right. <laughs> so, well, the trailer for that movie, the Flash trailer, Michael Keaton's in the movie. Okay. And he's playing he's playing Batman now, what, almost 45 year, I mean, no, 35, I don't know. A long way from mm-hmm. when he played in 89. But there in the trailer, you got the flash going, you're, and, and Michael Keaton repeats the line from the first movie, I'm Batman. It just, I'm like, ooh, this, this might actually be good. So we'll see. DC, um, which is kind of going to roll into my next subject here as we're talking about football. Um, mm-hmm. But DC, as we know, has kind of fallen flat with. Uh, well, actually, but before we get to that, can I just talk about the uh, game real quick? Yeah, no, no, no. I was just going to say they, they've fallen flat with Black Adam, but that's. We'll talk about that in a bit, but let's talk about the game. And Yeah, I just realized um, I never gave you my thoughts on the game. So I, I did think it was an entertaining game. Uh, oh, you know, yeah. Obviously, there it was, was a good a, game. It, to me, it was very reminiscent of the uh, Patriots-Eagles Super Bowl from 2017. You yeah. Know, w- one of those situations where the offense just moved the ball at will, and it did feel like you know, there was basically two plays, three plays that came down to deciding the difference. Obviously, Jalen Hurts' fumble, you know, giving a tie 
uh, right. to the Chiefs. And then, um, uh, what was the, I can't remember his name, the uh, punt return that set up the last it, Chiefs touchdown. Yeah. Yeah. And then, the Chiefs. And, yeah. And then obviously that uh, penalty that essentially iced the game in Kansas City's favor. But right. I, I, I did think it was an entertaining game. I'm not going to go so far as to say that it was, you know, one of the best. Super Bowls I've ever seen or that it was epic. I think the fact that we didn't have that dramatic ending with, you know, Jalen Hurts trying to drive the team down the field in the last 90 seconds to at least tie it, but possibly even win it kind of ruined yeah. it. Um, and not only that, but like, I'm someone who typically, I, I would much prefer to see a 28, 24 game. And, you know, then something where both teams are, you know, getting up in the thirties because I, I, I do enjoy when defenses are able to make some, you know, a few big plays throughout the game. And I think it adds a little bit to the drama when you don't really suspect or know for certain that the teams are going to be able to move the ball up and down the field at will. You know, it's like, right. I think that, I think the possessions kind of are a little more valuable when you're going up, going up against a defense that can, you know, turn the ball over at least, you know, force a few three and outs in a rows or a few punts yeah. in a row. And I, I kind of feel like that drama was a little absent just because of it that was. Fact. Yeah, it was. I mean, there were some, Obviously, there were some good, great defensive plays and mm -hmm. turnovers that led to scores that, you know, obviously could have. It was very, it was very much an even game between both teams. Either 100%. team could have win, but it boiled down to who had the ball at the end. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you put the ball in Mahomes' hands at towards the end of the game, it's kind of like that, you know, that way back when, and you're too young to remember this. But anytime Joe Montana had the ball last, like, oh, yeah, we left too much time on the clock. And, of course, right. Montana, as Montana always did, even back when he played for Notre Dame. Uh, and that just shows you how old I am. Um, I've seen I've seen that Cotton Bowl game, actually, against yeah. Houston. Yeah, yeah. pretty. it was pretty improbable what he did. And, yeah, I, I think that's obviously the, you know, the benchmark for what a legendary quarterback is, you know, when the time is right for you to come and give your team a victory, whether you're from behind or whether the game's tied and you're automatic right. and Mahomes was automatic. I mean, I think I uh, saw the stat that he only missed. He only had one incompletion in the second half and he didn't yeah. have his, his numbers weren't gaudy by any means, but no. well, know, he, he didn't, was, they didn't need to be, they didn't need no. to be. And you know what? I'm a Mahomes. I'm not a chiefs fan. In fact, mm -hmm. I, I, I despise, you know, the chiefs and uh, I, but their fan base is the third most annoying fan base in the NFL. Packers mm -hmm. and Cowboys are, are, are one and two. Um, wow. And as somebody who grew up in Chicago, um, you know, obviously anytime the Packers lose, we, we, we believe that an angel gets its wings. So, <laughs> so. Well, there's but, quite, a few, quite a few angels this year. <laughs> uh-huh. Uh-huh. Um, but I had Mahomes on my fantasy football team, my office fantasy football team, and I had AJ Brown mm -hmm. with the Eagles. So I, cruise to an office victory this year right you know right after i retired so i mean i know that mahomes you give the guy you give mahomes a ball magic's just gonna happen and it just that's that which you know i mean it's a whole nother you know chicago bear fans still go nuts because the bears could have had mahomes yeah, that's right. They uh, did they draft Fields instead of uh, yeah, they traded Mahomes. up and to Fields, and then Mahomes went after. It's like you know, you yeah, know. and I th I think he's just another example of uh, I guess in some ways how the um, the difference in the college game and the program has diminished so much because you know coming from that Texas Tech air raid style of offense, you know people you know question you know you may be putting up five hundred yards a game passing the ball four hundred yards, but. You know, like, can you really play our style of football and do it, you know, the way that we have typically done it for however many years now? Right. Um, you know, he, he came in against the Chargers, I think, the last game of 2017, whenever their Alex Smith was yeah. sat down for, uh, you know, just so he didn't get injured when they had a playoff game the next week, and he just tore it up. And, I mean, I can remember being in Atlanta whenever uh, I first moved there. I went to the Steeler bar that I ended up going to for a few years. It was my second time there. And Mahomes comes in and throws like six touchdowns and people like, you know, thought, you know, he's going up against the Steeler defense. They always do well against, you know, young right. players and he just absolutely carved them apart. And, and watching that, I was like, man, this guy really is a, a sensational story so far. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he is, I mean, it, it's nice to see that, but when you're playing against them, you're like, Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah you, you, you know, you know, the story is pretty much written. But when Mahomes started coming up, remember that ankle tackle, 
Mm-hmm. And he oh, was yeah. limping off like, ooh. I mean. I thought the but, Super Bowl was ruined at that point. I did too. I'm like, oh, but, but you know, then the flip side is you got Jalen Hurts, which is a hell, he's a hell of a story. Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. And so I do remember, I, I remember yeah. whenever he was uh, in college being benched in the national right. championship game. I remember watching that, uh, seeing him on the sideline with his helmet. And then they had made the announcement. I don't, I don't know who the sideline reporter was, but she had said that, uh, they were going with Tua, and I, you know, I was like, you know, did did he get hurt or not? And it didn't seem like it. You know, he still had his helmet on. Uh, I guess just what's the same. Saban thought that Tua had something to move the ball and against Georgia. Um, and yeah, that that that's something that can really, you know, knock a guy off course, right? You know, psychologically, you're like, you just got benched in front of however many million people that were watching the game. Yeah. You really didn't do anything to lose your job. You know, the Alabama was undefeated that year. He was having you know, a pretty decent season from what I remember, but, you know, yeah. persevered. And then, you know, now, you know, he's proven that he can compete with anybody in the league. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's one of the elite quarterbacks. I mean, at least, I mean, he had the best record pretty, I think the chiefs had the, who had the best record at the end of the season? Was it the chiefs or the Eagles? They were tied. They were tied. They, so I think they both finished uh, 14 wins and three losses in the regular season. Yeah. So you lead a team to the best record in the N- one of the best records in the NFL. You make it to the Super Bowl, mm-hmm. and the loss is not. I mean, he didn't he didn't do anything to lose that game. They just ran out of time. Right. I mean, I mean, he's. You know, I mean, I'm 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 hoping to see him back. I mean, um, next year's well, yeah, fantasy like, football draft, he'll go number one or two. I'm pretty sure. Oh yeah, easily, and <laughs> yeah, it's kind it's kind of like the analogy to the Super Bowl that the Eagles won a few years ago. Yeah, you know, it's like when you have these offensive shootouts, more or yeah. less, it comes down to you know just one or two plays on defense or on special teams that you know kind of make up the difference, and that was exactly what happened. Yeah, yeah, it, but it was, but it was a good game. But it was, it was a yeah. good game. I mean, it wasn't, um, you know, I mean, I grew up in a time when all, most Super Bowls were blowouts. So I mean, you know, yeah, nowadays. Exactly. Yeah, I was explaining that to my roommate last night where there was a a few years where it just wasn't really enjoyable to watch. You just had the Broncos getting blown out a couple times, the uh, Bills, the Chargers. Bills, the Char. I mean, I could, you know, I mean, starting with the first Super Bowl I saw, which was Super Bowl eleven. I mean, the the Oakland Raiders blew out the the Vikings. The next year, the Cowboys blew out the the Broncos. Mm. You know, Super Bowl thirteen to me is still the best Super Bowl ever. But then again, that was a 35 to 31 game. Mm -hmm. And I was 12 years old at the time. And for many years, that was the best Super Bowl out there. That, I mean, just how bad the other Super Bowls were. And then it, till you got to Super Bowl 25 and that's when things started to turn around, but it was slow, but yeah, nowadays, at least the Super Bowl, we go into it thinking, well, this should be a competitive game. But yeah, years and years before it was, it was, it was a snore. Yeah, I think the the only real blowout I've seen in my lifetime was uh, when Seattle destroyed Manning in the Broncos. Oh, yeah, yeah, that that was that was pretty unbearable to watch. And well, in uh, that game, in that game, when that snap went bad over yeah, Manning's yeah. head, like yeah. yeah, that's the game right there. This this is not going to go well. For, and it sure as shit, it did not go well for the Broncos. Yeah, and, and it was a shame too because you know you have one team that was, you know, the Legion of Boom. It was you know regarded as you know the best new defense in the league, and went on eventually become sort of like the defense of the decade. And then you had this record-setting offense. Yeah, I think that I, I think that was when Manning threw like fifty-five touchdowns to break Brady's fifty touchdown record, and he actually and he sat one game too, which was pretty remarkable. But um. Yeah, that, that didn't really kind of come to fruition the way that we had all hoped to see the best, you know, one of the best offenses in history versus, you know, a defense that had come into its own. Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, fortunately, a few years later, we got the flip side with the Broncos. Their defense comes in and just was unstoppable in Super Bowl 50 playing against Cam and the Broncos defense just completely grounded the, the Panthers. And, you know, you had um, Peyton Manning just kind of playing. I mean. All he, all he had to do was manage the game, just not make any mistakes. And, yeah. you know, that was, you know, so, um, but yeah, no, this, yeah. And it'll be interesting to see uh, how things progress. I mean, where's the Super Bowl being played at next year? Do you know off the top of your head? Vegas. Okay. 
which I'm sure Pete Rosell is rolling around in his grave right now. Oh man, that's well, and you know that kind of goes into probably what want to talk about just kind of where the football is heading to and Mm -hmm. you know gambling obviously is a huge factor in um with sports nowadays but it is funny now that i'm thinking about it talking about vegas um this year i mean the ads were out there for fan duel and all the gambling you know but not as much as in years past did you notice that at all the only fan duel commercial that i remember seeing was uh the gronk Okay, which, I, which I, I didn't really follow what that was leading up into it. So to me, it, right. just, it just looked like shit from the beginning. But um, yeah, I, I guess I now that you mentioned it, didn't see too many commercials. I mean, there was DraftKings and um, what was the other one? FanDuel. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I saw one of each, but I didn't see any Caesars commercials with actually are kind of my favorite anyway, because it's got the Mannings and it's got JB Smoove. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But yeah, no, we've got, I mean, we're entering, we're in an era nowadays where, like you said, Pete Rosell has got to be rolling over his grave with the way gambling is so infiltrated, not just football, but sports in general. Mm-hmm. Now that, I mean, and they were talking, who was I listening to? They were talking, I think it was maybe Dan Patrick I was listening to the other day. And they were talking about, well, how do you keep games from being fixed now? Well, Obviously, these guys get paid so much money. They don't need to. They, I mean, the temptation for these guys. I don't think there's any temptation because they're making so much money mm-hmm. just to play the game itself. I mean, um, but yeah, no, it's you know, I don't know actually where I'm going with this, but well, it's the gambling you're... aspect is just it still blows my mind all these after all these years. Well, it's funny you bring that up because recently I've been, uh, you know, flipping through Dan Moldea's book, Interference, about how organized crime infiltrates professional football. And the book was written, published back in the late 80s. So, you know, in a lot of ways, it's dated. Right. And it may not hold up as well. But it, it is interesting in some of the things that you look at that could still be a factor, right? Like, obviously, you know, a bookmaker would have a hard time convincing a guy to throw a game, you know, through bribery because you're not going to match his salary, you know? Right. Maybe, maybe, maybe someone in college, I, I suspect it would be possible, but even then, I'm not sure that you could really get away with it just because of how, you know, much security is probably around those kids from especially the bigger schools, in which I'm right. sure, you know, they have like, you know, uh, security personnel to watch these kids and make sure that they're not, you know, getting in trouble in the community mm-hmm. or something. But, you know, one, one aspect that he did bring up uh, when he interviewed, I think it was Warren Welsh, who was one of the former NFL security directors that, you know, if a guy like has a history of drugs, right. And, you know, all of a sudden he gets into a little, a little bit of a bad habit. All a guy has to do if he's in debt to his drug dealer, say, hey, you know, you shave some points and your debt is wiped clean. Or wiped clean. So I guess in some ways, it yeah. would have to be more through, uh, you know, extortion means if you're going to get someone to fix the game. But yeah, just through straight bribery, I'm not sure it's possible anymore. Right. And then there's also the other added thing, too, which we didn't even talk about. But we live in a day and age where everything is recorded. Everything's out in the open. Oh, yeah. I mean, we all walk around literally with I mean, we we all walk around with things in our pockets that make us we can report live from anywhere in the world and take yeah. pictures that the quality of is way better than anything anybody could have dreamed about back in the 20th century. So, um, yeah. but yeah, no, I just, yeah, we got Vegas next year, but yeah, the whole gambling, I mean, do you see, I mean, and you're much younger than me. So, I mean, um, do you see, do you foresee in the future gam even more gambling or, I mean, or have we, do you think we've reached a saturation point where, you know, as long as it makes the NFL a profit, then yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, I mean, I think it's just one of those situations. Like, I, I personally don't bet on sports. I mean, for me, if I bet, it's like I'll go to a casino and play blackjack, or if I'm playing pool, right? I'll, I'll put you know 20, 20 bucks on a game or something like that. But you know, I personally don't bet on anything that I can't really have some sort of direct involvement in. Oh yeah, um, yeah. I was so, explaining this to my wife the other day. I don't understand why anybody would throw money away. Yeah, I mean, well, <laughs> because because the reward you could get, right? I mean, it's right. like. Yeah, you could take a loss, but you could also double your double your money, you know. So it's like, you know, for the NFL, if it continues to make them a profit and you know drives people, then yeah, absolutely, it's going to continue to increase. You know, will there ever be a, a tipping point? Probably not. I mean, I think that 
obviously with how fantasy is going and prop bets and parlays, I think there's a lot of intrigue right. for people who aren't even sports fan, which yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's something I think that has really kind of defined Roger Goodell's career is how he's been able to I- increase the sports appeal to non football fans. You know I mean? Right. People, I, I know people who, you know, will watch maybe, you know, some game on Sunday, you know, but they're, they're not going out of their way to watch it the same way I would, but they have a fantasy team and they keep up with it and they set their yeah. lineup every week, even if they watch the game or not. And it's the same thing, I guess, with sports betting too. It's like, you may not have any rooting interest in either one of these teams or know who any of the players are, but you'll just look at the numbers of who's doing what and you'll place a bet. So right. I, I think as long as it continues to bring in, you know, non-fans to the game, yeah, then yeah, absolutely. It's going to get even bigger. Yeah. And, um, you know, with the sport itself. So you know, we've got now that the Super Bowl is over, but we're uh, we definitely got more football coming up this uh, mm-hmm. the rest of this year. So we're entering into I mean, this is this coming Sunday, the XFL kicks off. Mm-hmm. Um, what are your thoughts? Do you think uh, I mean, this is the XFL. This is obviously version 3.0. But yeah. what do you think? I mean, do you I don't know. I'm just going to, I'll, I'll let you tell me what you think. And I'll, I'll tell you what I think in terms of where I think spring football is, is going. And, and just from my experiences as a kid watching the other leagues growing up. Well, Orlando where I live is actually getting a team. So I'm going to follow them and actually go to some of the games and see Orlando guardians. Um, aside from that, I'm not really sure. I think there's eight teams total. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I guess it's hard to be, you know, overly optimistic that it's going to perform well. You know, obviously, you know, back in 2001, that collapsed for a multitude of reasons. Um, And, yeah, that was also a much different point in American culture where, you know, we still had – we didn't have any streaming. The Internet didn't really play that big of a factor in people's um, entertainment value. You know, it's still just more of a utensil than it was, you know, a lifestyle brand or choice, I guess you could say. So you didn't really have to worry about streaming. You had cable, obviously, that, you know, would maybe add some competition. But, you know, the three networks reign supreme still. Um, And, you know, they tried something out whenever they thought they could maybe find a new audience. And, you know, uh, again, there's a lot that went into it that kind of led to that collapse. But, you know, 20 years later, they try it again in a more saturated media environment. So. Yeah, I guess there's maybe you're never going to get a totally huge fan base like maybe you would have, you know, a few years ago when you try to experiment with it. But right. I, did I, you? I, go ahead. I'm trying to think. Did you interview the author of the Long Bomb on your show? Yeah, Brett Before, Forrest. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, yeah. Um, which go ahead. I didn't mean. I just just wanted to interject that in there. That's a great interview you did with him. Oh, thank you. Yeah, he was. Uh, he was interesting to talk to just because of how long ago the book was written. I mean, I think the book right. was published in 2002 and I spoke to him 20 years later and yeah. given how, you know, you know, the, the drive is still there to try to find some sort of alternative football league. I thought it was a relevant conversation and I haven't spoken to him since I did that interview, but I'm, I know he said that they were looking to do an audiobook version and uh, release a paperback version of the book by the time this new league comes out. So I wonder if there's any update on that, but I think, you know, in that conversation, it just highlights that people will go for football as long as it's good football, you know, and right. I, I don't really recall watching too much of the um, XFL in the right before COVID. I paid a little more attention to the AAF because there was an Atlanta team and that I went right. to a couple of their games. So for me, I paid a little more attention, but just seeing how, you know, both of those leagues ended up collapsing, you know, like I said, it's hard to have any sense of optimism, but yeah. You know, I mean, the USFL is back for, you know, round two, which I, you know, was kind of skeptical if that was actually going to happen. So, you know, may, maybe, and from what I understand, the USFL is not even kicking off until like April or something right. like that. So their seasons don't even overlap. There's, yeah. So, yeah, maybe, I mean, but maybe, maybe they, people will have a natural entry. You know, I, yeah. I, I suspect that maybe the first couple of weeks or maybe, you know, the couple of weeks following week one are going to suffer a little bit just because I think there is a little right. bit of uh, football fatigue, but um yeah if the product is good enough maybe people will tune in but that is a big if and i hope i mean i hope so i mean i i'm very critical anybody who knows follows me on social media knows i'm very critical especially the xfl and the rock Mm -hmm. and all the faith put in when i ask people and i do apologize 
on your end, can you hear the the construction going on on my end? No. Okay, good. Because I have a whole ton of construction. So thank God software is able to filter all the, all, all the noise, the jackhammers in the back out. Um, but going back to what I said, you know, on social media, you know, I'm very critical of the XFL, not so much of the USFL, because I kind of get how the USFL is trying to market their league by, okay, we're going to test this out in front of a TV audience and go from there. Mm -hmm. Whereas the XFL, it's like, boom. I mean, it's it, to me, it's like, okay, we're going to be like the old AFL. We're going to start in cities where they don't have to, and this is what we're going to do. And so, you know, you had several examples of, of leagues that have failed just in the recent past. You had the AAF, which failed spectacularly. Um, Obviously, you had the XFL, mm -hmm. and also too the Arena Football League went away. I mean, you've had all these other leagues, these spring leagues, kind of either fizzle away, flop. But the one thing that you you know you, you kind of touched upon it when it came to the football, football was actually pretty good. AAF football was quality was good. The XFL 2.0 was good, but it didn't stick around long enough. You know, obviously the pandemic, you know forced it to close but then you had the xfl back in 2001 and the football net just completely sucked i mean it was it was like watching practice squats just it was just horrible football but there was a lot of things they actually got right too with vince mcmahon and how he i mean sky we have sky cam because of the xfl the original yeah, there's, yeah there was definitely a lot of innovations that you know were drawn yeah. from it like I, I i never watched that i ever saw a documentary about this was the xfl it's really good. Wait, it's definitely worth your time, man. Yeah, yeah. I'll definitely <laughs> it's definitely been on my list for a while. But yeah, to to your point, I mean to be honest, most of the games I did watch from that season, because before Brett came on the show, I wanted to go back and watch those yeah. games and kind of put myself in that mindset. Uh, but most of the games I did watch were either the uh, LA Extreme or the Las Vegas Outlaws because Brett had followed that team specifically right. throughout the season. Um, but something that you think is uh, interesting is that you, you said the um, Arena Football League last, like it was something that people had forgotten about. I don't think it's any coincidence that that league had actually stood the test of time for however many years. And I, I've said this before, and obviously we have a lot of crossover in our audience, so I apologize if people are hearing me say this again. But when I watch another football league, I don't want to watch a carbon copy of the NFL. You know, if the, right. if the product is really that good, fine. But yeah. truthfully, if the product was going to be that good, they'd be playing in the NFL, right? For me, right. if you right. really want to get my attention, I'll watch, you know, a league that has bizarre rule changes, you know, multiple men in motion. You can only, you know, you can have unlimited forward passes behind the line. Anybody behind the line of scrimmage can catch a pass. I'll watch that all day. And I don't care if I'm yeah. the only one who's watching it. You know, I think a reason why something like, you know, the arena league did well is because we know this isn't, you know, NFL football, but that's what makes it right. cool. quirky. And, and, and going back to what I said about the Arena Football League, they were around mm -hmm. for a long time, but their business model, but those teams came and went, came and went, came and went. Mm -hmm. So in many ways, it kind of felt, even though the league was around for a long time, it always felt like every year it was a new league because you just had different teams coming and going. Mm -hmm. There was no stability with the franchises other than, say, with the Arizona Rattlers. Mm hmm I mean, the Arizona Rattlers and the Tampa Bay Storm were around for a long time. Orlando Predators were around yeah. for a long time, but no real stability. None of the teams that when the, when the league finally did fold, none of those leagues were any of the original teams. So to me, it just kind of like it felt like the AFL kind of felt like when I was in Iraq. Mm -hmm. um, somebody said, well, we've been here in Iraq seven years. And somebody said what I worked on when I was as an as a intelli intelligence advisor mm -hmm. uh army officer made the comment no we've been here one year for seven years so you had turnover every year every year every year so to me while the afl was around the the Amer uh the arena football league was around all, many many years it just each year it just felt like a different league because so many teams came and went um but going back to what you were saying but with these leagues though I mean, the product on the field, especially let's talk about the, the product that was on the field in the last, say, 10, 10 years. Good product on the field. AAF, the XFL, last year the USFL had a good product. But 
to me, where it's always come down to, it's it's on the business end of these leagues that they completely fall flat. And going back to what you said about the original XFL, um, that business, that just, everybody got paid, but Vince McMahon pulled the plug because it wasn't going to make him any money. Well, it, it, seems to me that, it seems to me that the original XFL was more of a marketing problem than it was a financial problem. Right. Or it, it eventually translated into being a financial problem, but People just didn't know what they were exactly tuning in for. You know, were they tuning in to watch serious football? Uh, were they turning in to watch, you know, a football version of WWE? No one really knew exactly like how to quite market it. You know, when you when you right. got Jesse Ventura ready to fight the Chicago coach on the on the field after they lost, you know, you, you're kind yeah. of looking at it. You're like, is this stage? Is it serious? Like, no one no one really knew. And I think for a lot of the players and the coaches, they wanted you know, football the way they had always known it in the NFL or in college. And then all of a sudden where they get all these cameras really intrusive in people's faces and player introductions and the showmanship of it and, you know, the the sex appeal of it all. You know, I, I think there was you know, a clear divide between what the, um, you know, what NBC wanted, what McMahon wanted. And I think in many cases, NBC and, you know, McMahon didn't really understand each other, what each other wanted for the product. And I think that there was never a coherent, you know, definition or vision for what the league should be. And ultimately they didn't really know how to market it. And people said, well, you know, this is all well and good, but the product isn't even that good for me to stick with long, stick long enough to figure this out. So they just abandoned yeah. it. Yeah. That, but I mean, his book, and the fact that they continue to play their games on Sunday on Saturday night too, which is like the least uh, view is the worst night for television, right? To, you know, for viewership, I, that was not a good decision either. Yeah, yeah, and I think these new leagues have taken those lessons mm -hmm. and learned. But the AAF, obviously, you know, they they learned a lot of lessons, but they just ran out of money. Yeah. You know, Charlie, and you would think of all the people that would fail at this, how could Charlie Ebersol have failed at the AAF seeing, but it just, it's, and so that's a book that I'm waiting to read on the AAF. Just, I mean, there is a documentary on it. If you've seen it. Um, no, I, it, I heard the interview Tim Hamlin did with uh, the director. I don't remember the name of it though. Yeah. Tim did a great job. I and mean, that was a great interview, but just, I would love to read a book that gets into the nitty gritty much like, you know, Mark Speck's books about, you know, the World Football League, um, get into the get into the WFL. And, you know, there's like you said, there's a great, you know, the, uh, the long bomb. I mean, that gets yeah. into so much detail and you walk away from that book going, OK, yeah, now it makes sense. And even mm -hmm. with, with Vince McMahon trying to buy his way into the CFL. Oh, that's that's happening again. No, but that was back then. Oh, yeah, yeah, remember yeah, okay. in that book. Yeah, that's yeah. kind of how that started. I think the XFL, that's how the XFL came to being when, you know, tr they wouldn't, you know, he, the XFL, he couldn't the get into CF the NFL or the CFL. Right. Well, what was it? What was his, uh, I don't think he was just trying to get it. See, wasn't he trying to buy the league outright? He wanted to buy the whole league. He said, well, how about yeah. the league? I think if I remember correctly, it started with the Argos, but then yeah. he's like, well, I'll buy the whole league. And, you know, the CFL governor said, you know, go pound sand. You're not buying our team. You're not going to buy our teams. Right. So, <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I mean, well, that's the consistent thread through all these stories, right? It's about the, uh, the rejects that, you know, maybe don't have quite enough money or they just can't break into the, the big leagues with, you know, the NFL for some reason. So they try to set out on their own. I right. guess, you know, obviously going back to the arena, Jim Forrester or Jim Forrest yeah. was probably the, the exception to the rule because, you know, he was more of, you know, someone who came up in the NFL, you know, corporate side than he was, Right, um, you know, as an owner, but I I think it's when, when it comes to like the, a book about the AAF, though I I don't know if there's too much there that you can really go into because they never even finished a full season. I mean, from right. what I remember, they only got halfway. Is that correct? Do you remember? They got I think up until like week eight or maybe week seven. Yeah, it was you know I mean or in fact you know talking about Orlando, I mean that the team in Orlando was. I think ultimately determined to have won the, the championship. Cause I think Steve Spurrier went out and bought everybody rinks or something. I think that <laughs> was, uh, like that. well, they had a team in uh, Tampa, I think. No, no, they had, it was the Orlando Apollos. That's right. Okay. So the XFL was, uh, had Tampa, right? Yeah. Which that, yeah. that team name is now out in Vegas, the Vipers. which, 
yeah, which they're going to be playing. And this gets into my, you know, I'm just curious to see what the first week one of the XFL looks like, because last I heard, I think the Vipers are playing at the minor league ballpark, which, mm-hmm. you know, Hey, I'm all for, I love, I've only been, I love what the aesthetics of football and baseball parks, but when, you know, you're starting off playing in a baseball park and a major metropolitan area and a minor league ballpark, that's just not a good, I don't, I'm just curious how that's going to look on, on camera. So, um, and how fans are going to take to it going, okay, are we going to watch minor league football? I mean, people go out, I mean, minor, nobody, nobody puts minor league baseball down. So I don't understand why anybody would put minor league football down, but you know, in this country, in America, well, not in this country, because I'm in Japan, but in, in the States, if it's not NFL, very few people are going to pay attention. If it's not NFL or college football, major college football, very few people are going to tune in. Well, last night, one of the people who was over at our apartment had actually asked about, you know, you guys down to go see some Guardian games. Yeah. And, you know, he, he he's someone who is, uh, you know, I don't think he has a team loyalty, but, you know, he loves fantasy. He loves, you know, right. watching the game just as, you know, just a, a third party viewer, I guess you could say okay. there's, you know, knowing he, he pretty much looks out for his fantasy team, so to speak. Okay. And, you know, but just, yeah, enjoys, yeah. but just, yeah. just enjoys watching the game, right? Well, he actually brought it up. So for me, I thought that was kind of surprising because okay. you know, if anybody was going to bring that up, it, it would be me because, you know, yeah. I'm just fascinated more so than he would be. But, yeah, you know, I, I think the potential is there, you know, for something to come to fruition, if nothing else, just for the novelty and the spectacle of it. But right. Yeah, yeah, that's only going to last you a few weeks, you know. Even for me, you know, watching the, uh, I was actually at a Atlanta Hawks game. Whenever the, um, uh, I can't remember what the name of the Atlanta team was. The Legends, I think. Um, that for the AAF. Oh yeah, yeah. And, you know, I, I was checking my phone throughout the the Hawks game. You know, interested to see you know what was happening right. and everything like that. But then you know, progressively, you just start tuning in a little less, less, and less. Yeah. And then, you know, been, I went to one game where they played at Georgia State Stadium. Um, and even then, you just see kind of the crowd had just diminished from what it looked to me on television, you know, the right. first night watching it. Um, so, yeah, th- there's definitely going to be some trial and error. And, you know, where, where the USFL really has that their strength is that they're owned by Fox. You know, right. they, 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 they can afford, you know, they have people who are so – in touch with the product because they own the product. So they know how to market yeah. it. They know how to have it as a good operations. And I think in a lot of ways, they're looking at this, like what it is. And it's a developmental league, you know mm-hmm. I mean? They not only for the players, but also for the broadcasters, you know I mean? They have Drew Brees, uh, I think coming over from NBC to do some games. I mean, they have some of their own talent that are going to, you know, do some sideline reporting as sort of a, a stepping stone. So when they want to get to the NFL or if, if that ever happens, but I think there's a certain self-awareness with the USFL and I didn't really watch too much of the league last year, but I, I think there is a self-awareness that if I had to guess right now without seeing the XFL or without seeing any XFL games so far, they probably have a little bit more of an advantage in the long run. Yeah. 